So I am uh, very, very excited about starting our new series this morning because it's essentially all about us. Um, not really, everything we do here is actually all about Jesus. Um, but our new series, we are calling it We Are Sunrise. And in this, uh, this series, we're asking the question, what is Jesus' plan and purpose for us as a local church? Or as you've heard me say sometimes, as a faith family. What, what is his plan and purpose for us? I mean, have you ever given it uh, much thought? Why has God granted us to be a local church on this island? I mean, you know, uh, we've been here now, what, eight, nine months? And, and there's pretty much a church on every street corner, so to speak. So, so why has he granted us to be a faith family on this island? What is our purpose? And as I was explaining to our our volunteer leaders last Sunday evening. This is pretty much the question that I have been asking since we landed on Ireland. You know, Lord, show me what, why do we exist? What is our purpose on this island? And um, we, you know, we can give a, a good Christian answer. We can say, oh yeah, we're here to love Jesus and, and love each other, which is a brilliant, brilliant answer. And I'm trusting that we're doing it. I'm trusting that all churches on Ireland are doing that. But what I did... Uh, especially for the first few months while we were here, I asked several people uh, in Sunrise and outside of Sunrise, I asked them what they thought about Sunrise. You know, when people outside of Sunrise heard that I was the new pastor, they said, oh yeah, we've heard about Sunrise. And I said, well, well what have you heard? And uh, two of the most common answers were, oh, you're the expat church. <laughs> now, they did say it in a friendly way, but I don't want us to be known as the expat church. Yeah, uh, don't get me wrong, I feel very happy that expats you know, feel welcome here and, and, and feel to make this their home. That's, that's wonderful. But what it communicates is exclusivity. It's kind of like a separatist mentality which is totally contrary to the gospel. The gospel has broken down all ethnic barriers. I want us to be a representative local church. The second thing I heard, and again this was said in a nice joking way, is that, oh, you're the flip-flop church. Yeah. Now, yes, I occasionally preach in flip-flops, and I know my predecessors preached uh, in, in flip-flops. Um, and I'm totally fine with our casual dress code. But then I began thinking, but what does, what does it communicate? What else could it communicate ab about us? Are we casual about our theology? Are we casual about our faith? Are we casual about sin? Are we casual about holiness? Are we casual about making an impact on this island and in the world? And so as I listened to all of these stories and I listened to all of these opinions, none of them communicated what we should be and who we should be about. And so I thought, well, Jason, what do you want to hear? What, what do you want to hear? And I thought to myself, well, I want to hear something. I want to hear something about Jesus. I want to hear something about the impact that he's making. And so as an eldership and as a staff, we've been talking and we've been praying uh, over the last couple of months. And we came, up to, we came up with the following answer to the question, why do we exist? I'm going to show you. Oh dear, if I don't trip over everything. Can you see that? Can you see the bottom part? Yeah. That's the important part. So Sunrise Community Church, why do we exist? We exist to know Jesus, and it's not a full stop. We exist to know Jesus and make him known. I want us both individually and corporately as a faith family, as a local church, to believe in Jesus to believe in Him as our Lord and Savior, and to grow in an ever-changing, ever-sanctifying relationship with Him. So much so that we cannot help making Him known in this world, in this world that so desperately, desperately needs a Lord and a Savior. And so for the next four weeks, this is simply what we're going to be doing. We're going to be unpacking what this statement means, to know Jesus 
and make him known. Now, now listen, this is not an original mission statement. I don't mind not being original. Many other churches, many other organizations, missional organizations use this, which is fantastic. Because the, the more Christians and the more churches and the more missional organizations that adopt this and actually live this out, can you imagine the impact that we will make on this island and in this world? So having said that, here's our plan, here's our purpose for this morning. Sunrise can and must exist to know Jesus and make him known, and here's our angle this morning, in a deceived world. Now if you're here this morning and you're kind of still making up your mind about this whole Christian thing, that might sound offensive, so let me explain what I mean by deceived world. I think this world that we're living in has been blinded to who Jesus truly is to what he actually accomplished on the cross and why he had to accomplish that on the cross. I think this world that we're living in is blinded to the true meaning of his grace, his love, his mercy, his truth, his holiness, and what he requires of us as believers. And so I want us to grow in a relationship and an understanding of the true Jesus so as to truly make him known in this world. So here's our plan for this morning. Sunrise exists, number one, in a deceived world, to know Jesus, and then finally to make him known. You can see that on the flip side of your bulletins. So here we go, point number one. Sunrise exists in a deceived world. So point number one here is all about getting a bit of a a reality check about the place that we're living in, about the state of the world that we're living in. And the word deceived implies, it implies that there is truth, but this truth can't be seen, that this truth is, is hidden or partially hidden, or something happened, but the true facts about it have been hidden or, or haven't been fully disclosed. And because of that, there are deceptive ripple effects or deceptive consequences that affect so many areas of life. Think about it this time, uh, this way. Think about how many times we develop a negative attitude towards someone because we heard something about them. But what we heard about them is not entirely the truth. But now we have gone and formed a deceived opinion about them, and then we go and tell other people what we heard about them, and they all form deceived opinions about this person. And so in the same way, if people don't hear the full truth about Jesus and what he actually accomplished on the cross and through the grave, then they are deceived into forming an opinion or a belief system about him that is not entirely true. And the scary thing is, is that this can and this has influenced various people groups for generations and generations. So have a look at the first part of our text today. Our first part of our story is found in Matthew 28 from verse 11. You can grab your Bible somewhere in a chair pocket in front of you or on the screen or on your Bible app. But I want you to look at this incredible story with me. I'll give you some context while you're getting there. So Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, uh, describes it like an earthquake. Uh, So we're talking about the the resurrection of Jesus. He's just risen from the grave, and Matthew describes it like an earthquake, which is, you know, we're able to identify with that now. Uh, We're not sure how, what the magnitude was, but we, we get it. And he says, this earthquake happened, the stone rolled away, and this angel then promptly sits on top of the stone. And uh, Matthew says the guards who, who were tasked with, with guarding the grave, making sure no one came near it, he says that they, they trembled and became like dead men. In other words, they froze. They, they couldn't do anything about what was happening. And then both the angel and Jesus, a little later, they tell both of the Marys, both Marys were on their way to the grave, they tell the Marys, hey, listen, go and tell the disciples what has happened and tell them that they are to meet Jesus in Galilee. Now we jump into the story at verse 11. Look at verse 11. It says, while they were going, that's, that's the disciples making their way to Galilee, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests. Now the chief priests were instrumental in the crucifixion of Jesus. Behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests 
all that had taken place. Like, you won't believe what just happened. There was an earthquake, an angel sat on the top of the stove. The, it's sown, but the craziest, craziest thing is the grave is empty. That guy, Jesus, he wasn't there. Now look at verse 12. And when they, that's the chief priests, had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, here comes the deception, tell people, in other words, tell people this, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. In other words, we'll, don't worry, we'll go to bat for you, we'll, we'll protect you, we've got you covered. Because the possibility was that the soldiers themselves could lose their lives for failing in their mission. But now, there's just no ways that they could go for it, right? There's no ways that they, that they could accept the money, right? Because think about what they've just experienced. Think about what they've just seen. They've, they've seen the gospel. We believe it by faith. They saw it. I mean, Jesus himself, he, he said that he would die, but then he would rise after three days, and he did it. They, they're seeing it. And so this proves everything about who he said he is. And it proves everything he taught is true. Because the resurrection of Jesus validates everything about him. So if the resurrection, listen, if the resurrection can be hidden, if, if something about it can be deceived so as to conceal it, then it discredits Jesus. So obviously they're going to say no, right? Because of what they've seen. Have a look at verse 15. So they took the money and did as they were directed. So money speaks louder than the truth. It also gives us an indication of just how sufficient the sum of money must have been that they would willingly risk their lives or at least their jobs. And so in order for the chief priest to continue their deceitful cover-up, they appeal to the soldiers' desires for money. And this is so part of our sinful nature. I mean, we even see it in our, our two little girls. You know, Paige, Paige will give up some candy to Emma if she promises not to tell on her. And Emma just can't refuse any form of candy. And so the truth about, you know, who knocked that over or who did that, the truth about whatever happened is lost. We, we'll never know. But I'm still baffled at these chief priests. Because this was so clearly true, and this so obviously confirms that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, that they themselves were waiting for. It's there in the Scriptures, our Old Testament. Why would they not want this? Because deception is essentially an issue of pride. Think about it. If the chief priests had admitted this, if they had confessed this, they would then be admitting or confess, confessing that they were wrong in all areas. That they were wrong about Jesus and therefore admitting that they, were, they had falsely accused him. Wrong about their theology regarding the coming Messiah and that they had misled all the people. They would lose their revered social standing in, in society and culture. They would uh, lose their authority. They would lose their credibility. They would lose all of their disciples that they were busy training according to their ways and according to their theology. Because who wants to be led by fraud? But I'm thinking, but there it is right, right there. The truth, this truth, the, the truth will set people free from their sin so they can be reconciled to their heavenly Father, and not just the people, but for the chief priests themselves. This is an opportunity to be reconciled to the creator of the universe. But they chose to hang on to their version of the truth. They chose to hang on to their authority. They chose to continue building their kingdom. And remember what we said earlier, that deception, the longer that it's concealed... It begins to affect all, all sorts of people. And over a very long time, have a look at the last part of verse 15. It says, And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. In other words, hey Jews, your Messiah has not yet arrived. 
You've got to keep waiting. You've got to keep looking out for him. In the meantime, keep observing all of your religious activities. Keep observing all of the religious law because he hasn't arrived. You don't, don't worry about the Jesus thing and, and all those rumors about him rising from the grave. And the sad thing is, the chief priests knew this. And the Roman soldiers knew this. And the scary thing, Sunrise, is that this wasn't isolated back then, to then only, and to the Jews only. Because the main goal of deception is to cover the ultimate truth about Jesus and who he is. And it's epidemic. This, this is way worse than the coronavirus and HIV and cancer all put together. Because Paul identifies the source of this deception when he writes to the Corinthian church. Have a look at 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He says, in their case, the God of this world, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. To keep them from seeing the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ultimate return of Jesus, he says, who is of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He says the devil wants to keep people in the dark. He wants to keep the status quo regarding unbelief in Jesus. He's deceived the minds of unbelievers so that they can't see, so that they can't believe in Jesus and what he's done, what he's accomplished on the cross. Or at least he keeps them deceived into believing a version of Jesus. A particular version of Jesus that allows them to continue with their particular mindset or worldview or their particular lifestyles. Because how many times have we heard this? Well, well the Jesus I know, well, the Jesus I believe in, he would never say something like that. He would never do something like that. And I'm thinking, well, how many versions of Jesus are there? There's only one true Jesus. Every other form is a deception. And this is the world that we're living in. This is the world that we're living in, Sunrise. A world that says, like the chief priest, no, no, I want my status quo to continue. I, I, I want my, con my kingdom to continue. I want my authority to, to continue. I want to be in control of my life. And if I'm going to believe in Jesus, then it has to be according to my terms, my version of Jesus that doesn't disrupt my apple cart. To which the devil says, amen. You preach it, brother. Or you preach it, sister. But no. Sunrise, we are going to exist to know the real Jesus the real Jesus in a world that has been deceived for far too long. So let's see, who, who is this real Jesus? The disciples continue on their journey, and they finally arrive at this mountain in Galilee where Jesus had instructed them to go. Point number two goes like this. Sunrise exists to know Jesus. And coming to know Jesus means first and foremost coming to faith in Him as our Lord and Savior. And then, like I said, growing in an ever-sanctifying relationship with Him. Meaning knowing Jesus will drastically and dramatically change your life in comparison to what this world says is life or lifestyle. And for some of you, you need to know this. The more you grow in your relationship with Jesus, the more you are going to look different to this world. Because you are going to get a new worldview. You are going to get a new purpose in life. You're going to have a new perspective on people and new meaning in life. So let's pick up the story in verse 16. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So two different reactions here. Some worshipped. So I imagine them, they're seeing Jesus and they, they fall to their knees or some just fall flat down on their faces and they worship him because Jesus was dead, but now they see him. Now he's right here. He is alive. Surely this means he is God. Surely everything he said, everything he promised throughout his earthly ministry with them is true. 
Because like we said earlier, the resurrection validates everything about Jesus. But some were like, I don't know. I don't know about this. I I can see you, Jesus. I know you're standing right there, but this just doesn't compute. I, I, I can't understand how this all works. And so sunrise, I want to say it's okay. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to have questions. It's just what are we going to do with those doubts and those questions? That's of paramount importance. Are you going to walk away? Or are we going to be like these doubting disciples who stay because they see him? And for us, we stay because we believe in him and we have his word. What he is about to say to them, we have that right here. So it's like, I believe in you, Jesus. It's just I'm having a hard time understanding you. Or I'm struggling to understand you in this particular situation that I'm in. Or I'm struggling to understand why you said that in your word. I'm struggling to understand why you did that, but I'm not going anywhere. Because I believe in you. And so what Jesus is about to do is say something that will help their doubting hearts to become hearts of worship and give the worshiping hearts more substance to grasp, something to hold on to. In other words, he's going to help them know him, truly know him. So look at verse 18. Look at what he says. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So the thing that is going to take a life of worship and awe of Jesus to the next level, and the thing that is going to dispel our doubt and our confusion about Jesus is a revelation about the magnitude of who he is and just how much authority and power he has. He says, all authority has been given to me. Not some authority. Notice Jesus doesn't interrupt himself with terms and conditions. He doesn't say, I have all authority uh, except when it comes to this situation or or except when it comes to this scenario or except when it comes to evil because evil is kind of like an equal but an opposite force in the world and we're kind of locked into this intergalactical cosmic force and and, and I don't know if I'm going to win but just hang in there with me. No, what he does is he takes it up a couple of notches. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's across two realms, a spiritual realm and a physical realm. The fact that he is standing there proves it. He's just destroyed death. For us in our physical sense, that's kind of like the end of the line, right? But he's just destroyed it because he's standing there now. And he's destroyed sin because death is the fruit of sin. And he's destroyed the devil because the devil brings out sin. He's just destroyed sin, death, and the devil. But some people still argue and they go, but yeah, but Jesus, you still died. You still died. The devil, representing the spiritual realm and, and, and human will, represented by the chief priest who decided to kill him, Well, Jesus, they accomplished that. They just simply killed you. So I honestly can't see how you can say that you have all authority. You can have some authority, but not all authority, because that just doesn't fit into my mind. That doesn't fit into my neat box that I have of you or my apple cart. Well, let me put some Bible underneath that. Look at this. Acts chapter 4. Verses 27 to 28. This is is a prayer that the disciples pray. So Jesus has ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit has come down. Uh, uh, Peter and John, they get into some trouble for starting to preach the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, But they're released. And so all the disciples come together and they begin to pray. And I just want us to have a look at a snippet of this prayer. Because it, it reveals some amazing theology about Jesus. Verse 27, they say, For truly in the city, right? So they're praying. For truly in the city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate. Now just hang in there for a second. That's some serious authority right there. 
Other than Caesar, these were, were, were two of the most powerful men around. Whatever they decided, it would happen. Take that guy out, that guy's taken out. Release that guy, that guy's released. It goes on. So both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, referring to the crowds that were saying, crucify him, crucify him. He's saying they had all gathered, verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what? No, no, Luke. Luke wrote the book of Acts. I'm like, Luke, you, you got it wrong, buddy. It, it was the will of Herod and, and Pilate and the crowds. Oh, We've got to look at this thing and go, no, th- this is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. What this prayer tells us is that God's will trumps evil both in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm. Now, here's what I did when I first noticed this. I went back and I read all of the accounts of Jesus before Pilate, Herod, and the crowds. And I was looking for some sort of clue that would tell me that they all became robotic in that moment. In other words, where something came over them that forced them to shout, crucify him, crucify him. But inside they're going, I don't want to crucify him, but I can't help but say crucify him. Or something to that effect. But there was nothing. The crowds were willingly shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We don't want Jesus, we want Barabbas. And Pontius Pilate, he willingly decided, you know what, I've had enough. I'm just going to wash my hands. If you want to crucify him, crucify him. I don't care anymore. So they willingly made their choices. But this prayer in Acts gives us the interpretation of what was going on there. The whole time they were playing right into God's predetermined plan. They played right into his predetermined plan to rescue us from our sin. How amazing is this? Jesus uses the evil intentions and the evil actions of man to ultimately destroy evil. He uses evil to destroy evil. And I'm thinking, how? That's just crazy. How? And Jesus says, it's it's simple. I have all authority. I have all authority over two realms. I will always have the final say. The world, the world can make its decisions. Sunrise, you can make your decisions. The chief priests, they can make their decisions. They can try and cover this up. They can try and uh, tell people that I'm not the Messiah. They can try and tell people that I didn't rise from the grave, but they don't have the final say. I have the final say because I have all authority. This is the Jesus I want us to know. Not the Jesus with some authority, not the Jesus that fits into our box, not the Jesus that fits into our lifestyle, this Jesus. This is what, sometimes, this is what it means to believe in him as Lord and Savior. We get the Savior part. We love the Savior part. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me from my sins. I'm forgiven. I'm justified. I'm going to be in glory one day with my heavenly Father for all eternity. But we need to be growing in understanding that he is Lord too. That he is king, that he is king of kings, that he is commander in chief over all things. And that should lead to a deepening sense of worship and awe and reverence for him. It should also lead to amazing comfort and amazing peace. Because no matter what befalls us in this world, he will have the final say. And he will use it for his glory, which always results in our ultimate good. Now, what do we then do with a growing relationship with this all-authoritative Lord, with this all-authoritative King over all things? Hopefully you're thinking, well, well, he's too good to keep to ourselves, right? I mean, there's, there's a world out there that doesn't know this about him. We have family members, we have friends, we have colleagues who don't know this about him. They need to know the true Jesus. They they have a deceived version of Jesus in their minds, which which is affecting or influencing their lifestyles. So sometimes we exist not only to know Jesus, 
but to go and make him known, like I said, in a world that has been deceived for far too long. Last point goes like this. Sunrise exists to make Jesus known. And this is how Jesus says we are to do it. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Verse 19, go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So in order to make Jesus known, we have to be a going church. In other words, we have to be an outward-focused church. We don't just get to know Jesus and then go all like bomb shelter on each other, you know, hunk it down and, and bunk it down until Jesus comes back and rescues us. No, he says we go and we tell all people groups, that's what he means by nations there. We tell all people groups about him. Now, a lot of people go, well, <laughs> you Christians, what gives you the right? What gives you the authority to tell me that Jesus is Lord and Savior, that he is the way to the Father? that his truth is the true truth. What authority do you have to do that? He does. He's just said, go therefore, go in light of the fact that I have all authority across two realms. And go do what exactly? Go make disciples. And that word make is a challenging word. It doesn't mean go make, go continue discipling disciples although that's a big part of what we do as Christians. We come alongside each other and we disciple each other. But we're also to go make new ones, new Christians. We're to go make disciples of people who are being discipled by the world, discipled by other things, other other people. Go to all people groups because they're blinded to the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for them on the cross. And then he says, and when they believe, we baptize them as a symbol of their belief, their faith in Jesus. We baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we continue to come alongside them. He says, now teach them. Teach them my word. Teach them his word, because his word is going to teach us who the real Jesus is. And his word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is going to continue opening our eyes to see the real Jesus, to say no to our sin, to say no to this deceived world, and to say yes to him and to live for him. But now, what I want us to do, what I want to do is show you on a macro level how we, as sunrise, how are we going to do this? It's one thing to come up or steal a cool little statement to know Jesus and make him known. But what are we going to do about it? How how are we going to do that? So I'm going to show you the skeleton of Sunrise Community Church. No one likes to look at a skeleton, but it's vitally important to keep us upright and enable us to do what, what we do, right? So have a look at this first diagram. Is it there? I hope you can see that. Two of the best environments, we believe, to grow in our knowledge and our faith and our understanding of who the real Jesus is are our weekly ministries, which is our Sunday service and our community groups. And in these environments, we have a high view of Scripture because, like I said, it's in the Scriptures that we're truly going to get an idea of who the real Jesus is. Not what culture says, not what the world says. And so everything we do on a Sunday is all about Him. Our children's church, our youth, our preaching here is all about Him, growing in our understanding of who the real Jesus is. And there's a real synergy between our Sunday services and our community groups. Because then when we get together during the week, we're going to unpack what we heard on Sunday, or the Scripture, we're going to unpack the Scriptures again that we heard on Sunday. So we can say it like this, Sunday is about the proclamation of God's word, but then on, during our community groups during the week, it's the application of his word. We're going to come alongside each other, sit in circles where we actually get to see each other, not the back of each other's heads, and we're going to apply the scriptures to our lives, hold each other accountable, do life with each other around the scriptures. Knowing Jesus is not just about a personal, experiential feeling, 
but being part of a community where we disciple each other to live out His Word. Next diagram, look at this. Because we can't stop there, right? Jesus says to us, go make disciples. We, we, we need to go make Him known. And where do we do that? In the places and the spaces where He has put you. In the mission field that He has given you. Whether that's at Foster's, at Kirk's, at KPMG, at Governor's Beach. By the way, supporting our international mission partners as well. And so as we grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and our awe of who He is, hopefully that flows out of us in such a way that we can't help making Him known wherever we go. And so can you see we need to change the way we see what we do? We're not to compartmentalize our lives. Like, this is me at work. This is me at, at the Sunday service. This is me in my community group. This is me at Governor's Beach. No, no, everything we do, everything about who we are is now about knowing Jesus and making Him known. We exist to make Him known in our respective mission fields. But it doesn't stop there. Last picture looks like this. What we will do and what we will continue to do is put on, for lack of a better term, missional ministries. For instance, Flourish, uh, Kids Fest, Christmas Eve services, men's breakfast, and, and God willing, some, some local outreaches in the not-too-distant future. But these ministries are, are either held once a month or, or maybe sometimes just once a year. But they are environments where those who are outside of our faith family can come and they can know Jesus and make Him known. They don't exist in and of themselves, these events. Because what I want us to think, I don't want us to think of Sunrise as a program-orientated church. And I'm not knocking those churches, but sometimes they go overboard. You know, like Monday night, you've got this program. Tuesday night, you've got this program. Wednesday night, this. Thursday night, that. Friday night, that. And Saturday, we might give you a break. Sunday, you've got to come back to church. And so they're great at equipping people. But where's the time to make Jesus known, to, to go be on mission with Jesus in the places where he has put you? And so I want us to think, no, Sunrise is a steps-orientated church. Everything we do has another purposeful step to it. For example, you know, you come to Flourish for the first time because you've just landed on Ireland. Well, guess what? There's another step. You can bring your husband, you can bring your, girlfriend, your, your boyfriend, you can bring your, your kids to a larger faith family where we get to know each other. Uh, there's, there's kids' facilities, there's a youth facility, and then, guess what? There's another step. You can get into a, a smaller community group where you can truly get connected, truly get to know people's lives, where you can truly be discipled and begin to disciple others. Comma, so that you can then go make him known in the places and the spaces where he has put you. Now, hopefully you're looking at this and going, well, well Jason, there's that's, that's nothing really new there. And that's right. What we've done is just brought a sink to all of the things that we do. Or another word we're using is we're bringing intentionality to everything that we're doing. There's now a flow and a purpose to everything that we do. We're putting the why behind why we do this. We want to know Jesus and we want to make him known. Now, I left the best news for last. The best news is this is going to work. This is going to work. And I'm not being arrogant. I know it's going to work because, not because of the steps, but because of the last thing Jesus said. Look at this. He said, and behold, I am. Just, just stop there for two seconds. Who is this I am? The one who's standing right there in front of the disciples. The one who has just conquered sin, your sin, once and for all. The one who has just conquered death. That you, death now simply becomes a doorway for us into our loving Heavenly Father's arms. 
He's just conquered the devil who will no longer deceive you and keep you from seeing your heavenly father and being with your heavenly father and living the life that he has purposed for you here. He says, and behold, I am that I am. I am with you always to the end of the age. What we are about, sunrise, cannot fail because of that promise from that Jesus. The all authoritative, sovereign, mighty Jesus. You and I have the privilege of getting to know him more and more. And the more we get to know him, hopefully, the more urgency and privilege we feel of making him known more and more in this world that so desperately, desperately needs to see him because they've been blinded to who he truly is. And we cannot fail because he cannot fail. His purposes and his will will always be accomplished because he says he has all authority. So, would you know him, Sunrise? Would you commit to be a faith family, to knowing Jesus, to coming alongside each other, to continue knowing Him, or maybe for you for the first time, believing in Him for the first time, and then growing in an incredible relationship with Him, to know Him, to know a promise like this, so that we can go and make Him known in this world, and this island that so desperately needs Him. Amen? I'd love to pray for us. And uh, Matt and the team can come up. I really am looking forward to the next three Sundays as we begin to unpack this a little bit more and trust that the Lord continues to stir in us this purpose and this mission in us. But Father, thank you. Thank you that you have called us. You've called each and every single one of us, first and foremost, to be sons and daughters in your family. And that is who we are, first and foremost. We're a family. You're our heavenly Father. But you've given us a purpose. You've given us a mission. We have, A, the privilege of getting to know you, Jesus, more and more. And as we do that, our lives will be changed more and more. But on top of that, we have the privilege of making you known in this world. We can't do that in our own strength. But we cling to the promise, Jesus, that you say that you are always with us until the end of the age. I pray that you would show us that, each and every single one of us here this morning who might be listening to this on our podcast or watching it on YouTube. In this moment, whenever they hear this, would you drop this amazing promise into our hearts that you, almighty Jesus, are with us. Therefore, we can do this. We can know you and make you known. In your name, amen.